Welcome to Feminine Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Gina Farrar. Each week, I bring you an inspiring conversation to help you navigate the challenges and changes of midlife so that you can not only survive, but thrive in your second half. Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. It is Gina here, and I am looking forward to our conversation today. This is our first time having a conversation about heart health for women. And today, my guest is Barbara Roberts. She is a retired cardiologist. She was the first female adult cardiologist in Rhode Island and remained the only cardiologist for several years. She is the director of the Women's Cardiac Center at the Merriam Center, and she is also the author of a book, How to Keep from Breaking Your Heart, What Every Woman Needs to Know About Cardiovascular Disease. So without further ado, let me welcome you, Barbara, to the podcast. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Gina. I appreciate the chance to talk about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> but I'm bumped. <laughs> you know what? I'm so excited because when you're, when the opportunity to interview you came across my desk, I was really excited to have this conversation. I know how uh, challenging it is in our world, like you were saying before we hit record about how cardiology was focused on men for the longest time. So before I jump in and start talking, why don't we take a moment and let you introduce yourself and what was it that led you to go into cardiology in the first place and then to really begin to focus on women specifically? When I was a medical resident at Yale New Haven Hospital many, many years ago, I attended a grand rounds given by a brilliant cardiologist by the name of Dr. Richard Gorlin. Dr. Gorlin and his father, who was a hydraulic engineer, had done research which allowed cardiologists to calculate the area of narrowed heart valves just by doing a heart catheterization and making some simple measurements. Now, for various reasons, particularly as we get older, some of our heart valves can start to malfunction. And one of the ways they malfunction is that they can become narrowed. And so he derived, he and his father derived this very elegant um, equation to help doctors determine how severe the narrowing was. And it was such a brilliant grand rounds. I thought to myself, I really want to study with that man. So I applied for a fellowship at what was then the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, which was one of the Harvard teaching hospitals, and I was accepted. And I was actually the first female Gorlin Fellow at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. And I spent two years there uh, so that I could become board certified in, in cardiology. And then I spent two years on the full-time faculty at Penn State's Medical School in Hershey, Pennsylvania after which I decided to go into private practice. But I wanted to go into private practice in an academic setting. So I came to Providence, Rhode Island, where a relatively new medical school had been started, the Brown University School of Medicine. And I began a private practice, but I also taught medical students and residents and interns and fellows. And I occasionally would lecture, and I also became involved in some clinical research. After many years in private practice, I was asked by the president of my hospital to start a women's cardiac center because she was an anesthesiologist and she would give anesthesia to people undergoing open heart surgery. And she realized, as I did, that women were being diagnosed at a much greater age than men. They were coming to surgery with more comorbid conditions like heart failure or high blood pressure or diabetes, and that they weren't doing as well as the men postoperatively. And I had realized the same thing as a result of being in private practice. So that when I went and took over the Women's Cardiac Center, and by the way, a lot of my male patients followed me there, so it wasn't that we were just taking care of women. We didn't turn anybody away. Um, but when I started the Women's Cardiac Center, I had already developed an interest in the differences in heart disease between men and women, which I had never been taught about in medical school. As I said earlier, the prototypical patient with the most common kind of heart disease, which is basically caused by hardening of the arteries, was always a male. And 
the typical male symptoms were talked about and the typical um, symptoms, for example, of angina, which is a type of chest discomfort you get if, you, if your heart muscle is starved for oxygen, or the typical symptoms that occur when you have a heart attack, where heart muscle actually dies because his blood supply is interrupted. Well, men usually get crushing under the best breastbone chest pain, and women may not have any chest pain at all. Women may just have shortness of breath or severe weakness or nausea. And so a lot of heart attacks were being misdiagnosed in women. And so I, I realized it became important to teach not just women that they might need to look at other things and the typical symptoms that, for example, their husbands might experience, but also to teach other physicians. And that was what prompted me to write my first book, How to Keep from Breaking Your Heart, What Every Woman Needs to Know About Cardiovascular Disease. That's an incredible service. You know, it's interesting. I've spoken with several doctors in different disciplines, and it's interesting how people come to this gift of a niche in their medical community. And I have heard a lot of things about, is it the Red Dress? Yes, the Red Dress Project. Yes, which is bringing that attention to women's heart health. So when you're talking about heart health, what are the things that are the most common for women and how do we identify that? Because, you know, stress can kind of create some, some symptoms that can feel the same, can't they? Yes. There are many so-called risk factors which will increase your chance of developing a certain disease. And we know very well what the risk factors are for developing what we call atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is basically cardiovascular disease caused by the buildup of plaque in the arteries supplying the heart. We know what those risk factors are. But it turns out there are some risk factors that are far riskier in women than men and other risk factors which are a risk factor in men but not in women. And we can get into that in greater detail. Now, some of the most commonly known risk factors for developing vascular disease are, number one, age. The older you get, the more likely you are to have built up plaque in the arteries throughout your body, not just in your heart. I used to tell my patients, every American over the age of 40 has some plaque in their arteries. So that's not even a question. The other... Uh, so in addition to age, the only other risk factor that you can't modify is your family history. And if you have a family history, particularly of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, by premature we mean 45 or younger in men, 55 or younger in women, then you are at increased risk of developing this disorder. Now, you may wish that you had different relatives, you may wish that you were born into a different family, but at least today you can't change your genetic makeup. And you can't change your age. You can lie about your age, but that doesn't modify it. But every other risk factor for cardiovascular disease is modifiable or completely avoidable. And one of the strongest risk factors is smoking. And smoking is actually more of a risk factor for women than it is for men. What is it that makes smoking more of a risk factor for women? Do we know? We don't know. There are some theories you can postulate that since women tend to be smaller than men or a given number of cigarettes smoked, they get a bigger dose of all the toxins and poisons in cigarette smoke. Or there may just be something about their biologic makeup that makes them more prone to develop problems when they smoke. Interesting. We just don't know. But we do know that, for example... If there was a study out of Denmark that looked at the age of first heart attack in women smokers and non-smokers and men non-smokers and non-smokers. And in women, the median age of first heart attack was 79 if you were a non-smoker and 60 if you were a female smoker. That's Whereas a in men, difference. that's a huge difference, 19 years. Whereas in men, the median age for first heart attack was 71 in men who didn't smoke, and 64 in male smokers. So the gap so, is smaller for some reason. Yeah, the gap is smaller. And there are, other, you know, there are other things that are more common in women who smoke. For example, diabetes. 
women who are heavy smokers increase their risk of diabetes. Interesting. A lot more than men do. And that's another thing that tobacco companies don't want you to know. If you're a woman and you smoke, you're much more likely to develop diabetes. And diabetes in women is far more deadly than it is in men. So you really want to see both of those things. Again, we don't know, but we know by looking at, uh, you know, vital statistics, you know, we know that 80% of diabetics die of vascular disease. And diabetes increases your risk not only of developing vascular disease in the larger or medium-sized arteries, but also in the tiny little arteries. And that's what leads to things like, you know, blindness and contributes to gangrene and amputations in diabetics. Mm -hmm. If you look at high blood pressure, high blood pressure is a risk factor that seems to be equal between the two sexes. If you look at cholesterol and blood fat levels, it's very interesting because cholesterol is carried in the blood by specialized proteins called lipoproteins. And everybody sort of knows that there's something called LDL, which is quote unquote, the bad cholesterol. And then there's something called HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And then there's another blood fat called triglycerides. Well, it turns out that in men, elevated levels of the LDL or so-called bad cholesterol is a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. It's not a terribly strong risk factor. Most people think it's terribly strong. It's not. In women, elevations in LDL cholesterol are not a risk factor at all unless levels of good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, are low. And in both women and men, high levels of triglycerides and low levels of HDL cholesterol are a much stronger risk factor than elevations in the bad cholesterol. And that particular combination, high triglycerides and low HDL, again, is more risky for women than men. And how do you develop high triglycerides and low HDL? Guess what? It's by following a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. So the diet that the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology pushed on people for years with no scientific basis actually probably increased the rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Wow. And that's, you said, high-carbohydrate, low-fat? High-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. Interesting. I do remember... Yeah, they lower HDL levels and raise triglyceride levels. Because of the carbohydrates, yeah. Particularly so what the starchy is- carbohydrates in the sweets, especially if you ingest starchy carbohydrates in sweets. So when the food companies, in their infinite wisdom, took out the fat from foods, which makes it taste good, they replaced that fat with sugar and starches. And when that happened, that's when the obesity epidemic in this country took off. So this was actually, unfortunately, what was being preached. And it was dead wrong. Oh, my goodness. So where are we at now with, I mean, there's a whole trend toward keto, which has worked really well for my uncle. He's uh, in his 60s, -hmm. getting his diabetes under control, as well as his other risk factors. But when it comes to women, I know how important fat is for our brain. It's brain food. It helps our bodies function. And I know there's better fats, you know, avocado or nuts and things like that. So tell me from your experience, what should women kind of be looking at in their diet to really put themselves in a better position to stay healthy? Right. I used to tell my patients, if you're really serious about heart health, you will eat food that's been monkeyed with by human beings as little as possible. In other words, eat food the way Mother Nature makes it, not the way some factory makes it. You want to keep processed food to a minimum, and processed food is anything that comes out of a box. Most things that come out of a bag, unless it's a bag of vegetables. So I can't tell you the last time I ate cereal. It's probably decades. And I love bread, don't get me wrong, but I keep bread to a minimum. I am very compulsive about not eating food that has added sugar. I, you know, it's been decades since I had a soda and I don't drink artificially sweetened sodas either. Any baked goods I make, I bake myself. And I use a lot of 
things like almond flour instead of wheat flour and coconut flour. I eat eggs. Eggs are very nutritious and all the nutrition is in the yolk. People used to think and be told they shouldn't eat egg yolks before they have, because they have cholesterol. Well, guess what? Eating cholesterol doesn't raise your cholesterol, <laughs> unless you're a rabbit. If you're a rabbit, yes. If you eat cholesterol, it will raise your cholesterol. But if you're a human being, eating cholesterol does not raise your cholesterol. You know, I and, never listened to that. I, my family's from Midwest, you know, so whole eggs where I never, I could never give up my yolks because I actually really don't like the whites. I need the yolks to hide the whites. <laughs> right, right. Well, you, your body was smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you say that, though, in terms of that's the first time I've heard it put that way, that eating cholesterol doesn't raise your cholesterol. So if eating cholesterol doesn't raise your cholesterol, besides genetic predispositions, what are the things that actually can cause a raise in cholesterol for us? Well, some people, when they eat a lot of saturated fats, will raise their LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. But LDL is not monolithic. It's the small, dense LDL particles that are thought to promote the formation of plaque. When you eat a lot of saturated fat, you increase the amount of large, fluffy LDL particles, which don't injure the vascular wall. So people have been misled in thinking, number one, that elevations in cholesterol are very risky. My total cholesterol, for example, is 300. I would never take a medicine to lower it. My mother's cholesterol was 300. We both have good levels of HDL. She lived to 88, never took medicine to lower her cholesterol, didn't die of heart disease. In women, cholesterol is not a risk factor. Elevations in triglyceride, and low levels of the good cholesterol are risk factors. And you can correct that by eating a low-carb, high-fat diet, if, in fact, you have high triglycerides and low HDL. Actually, nothing raises HDL more than saturated fat. The other fat that raises HDL are uh, the monounsaturated fats, such as are found in olive oil. And the um, omega-3 polyunsaturated fats are good for you. However, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, as is found in most of the vegetable oils, actually have a pro-inflammatory effect and are bad for you. It turns out that inflammation is a far more potent risk factor for laying down plaque in your arteries than any level of cholesterol. And we know how to treat inflammation. It's really simple. Eat real food. Don't smoke. Don't become overweight or obese exercise regularly, and learn the healthy way to respond to stress. Yes. Now, the stress in our culture, I think as time goes on in terms of history, things just seem to have a natural way of speeding up, right? Technology has created such a high-speed world where we're, our brains don't ever get to rest. Correct. If we don't guard ourselves, right? Because the information is so vast, we can't possibly take it all in. I'm sure this is not new information, but from your life experience as well as your practice, what kind of stress relieving practices or stress management, I don't know what word you like to use, practices, do you advise? Now, the food, it seems common sense is not always common practice, right? Right. Food that is, hasn't been altered. Awesome. So if we manage, if we do that, then how do we next manage our stress? Excellent question. There are several things that I think are important in managing stress. I would put number one as social interaction. The human race did not evolve as solitary individuals. We evolved in groups. We need interaction with other people. Now, obviously, there are some people who are toxic and you don't want to interact with them. But you need to develop friendship and you need to cultivate your friendships. You need to take time for yourself. I mean, I you know, had workaholic tendencies, as you can imagine. For many years, I was a single mother and in solo private practice. Um, but you need to take time away. You need to put your work aside periodically and do things that will allow you to rest and recharge. 
exercise. I find exercise absolutely key to handling stress. I always say that if I didn't exercise, I would either be in Butler, our local mental hospital, or the Adult Correctional Institute, our local prison, and probably the Adult Correctional Institute because I would have taken somebody out by now. So I exercise most days of the week. And I do a combination of aerobic exercise, which in my case now is power walking, and resistance training, that is uh, free weights and weight machines. Particularly in women, as we go through the menopause, it is absolutely crucial to maintain bone health by doing weight-bearing exercises. And I'm just going to give you part of my routine, which I do every other day. I do leg lifts. I have a, a machine that allows me to do quad extensions. I do three sets, 12 reps, 11 reps, of 10, and 10 reps with 70 pounds because I have a horror of falling and breaking my hip. And I would never take one of the bisphosphonate medicines that they tout as protecting your bones because they don't. They actually cause pathologic fractures and a lot of other problems. So that's just one of the weight exercises I do. And I do upper body, uh, you know, weight lifting. And I do 300 crunches every other day. So, and then I stretch. So it's very important. And sometimes I don't feel like working out. I have to drag myself down to the basement where we have a gym set up. But I do it because I know I'll feel so much better afterwards. It's like I just completely... At the end of my workout, I'm completely relaxed. The other thing I try to do, although I'm terrible at it, is meditate. And even if you're not good at it, I would urge you to read up on it or take an online course or go to a weekend retreat and learn about meditation and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to get terribly anxious and upset about everything that's going on in the world wonder whether or not we're doomed and become depressed. But that's not a particularly healthy response to everything that's going on. A healthy response is to say, yes, all these bad things are going on. What can I do to make them better? Yeah. You know, when you're talking about meditation, I would probably imagine that you and I have a similar tempo, which is go, go, go. And the go, go, go tempo even if your body's still, your brain is usually still just moving 100 miles an hour. That's kind of the tempo. I enjoy life at that tempo. But with different circumstances happening in my life, I started thinking, okay, I've got to learn to, to stop my mind for a minute. Yes. <laughs> you know, turn it off. And I got this app called Headspace. And it's a meditation app. And the reason I like this app is you can choose 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. There's nothing complicated. Like for me, I don't want all the music. I don't want all the, I just want something that tells me to stay focused. Right. right. <laughs> so it's like this really calming British voice. They talk a little, like I'm going through a stress series right now uh, because so much has changed in our life in the last year. And so he talks a little bit about stress and he kind of gives you something to think about, like watch what you're thinking. Right. And then mm -hmm. He, it's quiet. And then every once in a while, he'll chime in and say, you know, he'll tell you, remind you to breathe, remind you to close your eyes. And it's amazing what a 10 minute, just forcing yourself to sit still and shut your eyes. Because for mm -hmm. me, shutting my eyes and breathing alone is a huge vacation for my brain because my, my brain gets a break when my eyes are shut. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to say that that advice I've personally been practicing it, not as often as I should, but when I do, I can feel my heart rate coming down. I can feel my mind getting clear. I feel more energized to do what I need to do. And the difference between meditation and mindfulness, really, because I think people think meditation is like you have to be quiet for eight hours and you have to sit still. There's walking meditations that people do. Right. Do you kind of get in the practice? But mindfulness is literally just being present, right? It's being yeah. present with what you're doing right now. Like I'm looking at Barbara. Living in the moment. To Barbara. I'm not thinking ahead of what I want to say to Barbara. I'm mindfully going, I'm, I'm taking in what you're saying and, and really s holding space for it. Because I think my, these words are kind of thrown around a lot. But honestly, 
between you and I, Barbara, those two things alone can be game changers in how I show up in my world because I'm, I'm much more focused and much less distracted. Yes. You know, when it comes to those things, there would, those would be like soft skills, right? They're harder to measure. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, there are some people obviously who are very proficient meditators and, and, I'm never going to be one of those. I mean, maybe the Dalai Lama is a proficient meditator, but you know, I am going to keep practicing to try and become better at it simply because I know it helps me. It helps me sleep. It helps me deal with stress. And those are things that are very important. You know, it's interesting too, when I was thinking about your heart, because it's the thing that's pumping blood when we calm our minds we give our heart a break to some degree, do we not? Like if we yes. can get our mind to calm down. Right. There, there's a rich network of nerves connecting the central nervous system to the heart. I used to say to my patients, you can't separate the head from the heart without fatal consequences. So, yes, when, when, when you're emotionally upset, your heartbeat goes up, your levels of stress hormones go up, your blood pressure goes up. It puts acute stress on the heart. I have had patients with severe vascular disease who predictably would have angina in the face of emotional stress. And you could see the changes occurring on their EKG. Also, abnormal heart rhythms, which can be fatal, are known to be precipitated by stress. There's a syndrome called broken heart syndrome or Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, in which usually in response to an emotional uh, a sudden emotional stress, the heart becomes very weakened. This is, a, this is interesting. It's nine, more common, nine times more common in women than men. This is the a heartbreak syndrome. Broken heart syndrome. Broken heart syndrome. Where the, the heart muscle becomes extraordinarily weakened. And there can be changes in the blood tests that make it seem as if a heart attack had occurred. But you do a, a cardiac catheterization and there's no evidence that an artery is blocked, even though the heart muscle is very, very damaged. Usually it resolves spontaneously, but it can be fatal and it, it can recur. What brings that on? You said stress or like maybe... Very, losing often, very often it's a sudden emotional upset. Mm. Hearing that a loved one has died, hearing that you've lost a job that's very important to you. You know, I've heard of that before. Um, somebody was sharing that they had a perfectly healthy mother who passed away because her husband had died. They had no medical reason for her passing. And they mm -hmm. said something about, they said she died from a broken heart because there was, she was a hundred percent really healthy. She didn't have any yeah. health problems. Yeah. Now, just a side thought, is there something we can do? Obviously we can't control things out of our control, right? Right. But can we, develop practices to even for something like the broken heart syndrome are there things we can do to kind of is insulate the right word or protect ourselves by habits mindsets to kind of at least potentially be able to absorb those emotional blows a little better in your practice as a cardiologist what have you uh, found well I don't know of any studies it would be very hard to do a controlled study of this yes it would <laughs> And just about impossible. But common sense would lead us to believe that developing our skills of mindfulness and developing our ability to handle stress by whatever modality we use, I mean, other than, you know, abusing drugs or alcohol or, you know, cigarette smoking. Don't if, do that. That's not helpful. No, that's not helpful. That's, that's a, a surefire way for stress to kill you if you re react in that manner. But if you train your body and your mind to lessen the impact of stress by exercise, by a healthy diet, by meditating, by mindfulness, there's no reason to think that your reaction to sudden emotional trauma is going to be worsened and every reason to hope that it will be lessened. Yes. So basically those five or 10 minutes a day, which we really can find five or 10 minutes in a day. Right. Here's one of the things, Barbara, I don't know if you do this, but I'm a little bit of an independent thinker. And so 
they'll be like, you know, you should be sitting up, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. But I don't always choose to sit the way they tell me to. Sometimes I might lay on my back on the floor and prop my feet up on a chair. So, you know, encouraging people to find what works. Right. Find what feels good and, and practice it. I right. think uh, I was just talking in another interview about getting outside, breathing yes. real air, putting Enjoying your feet on nature. sand. What was that? Enjoying nature. Yes. It's, it's scientifically proven with the, you know, the energy of the earth, the ions, we're made of this same kind of thing when we ground ourselves just standing in the sand. Most people instinctively know if they're having a horrible day, they want to run to the beach and watch the ocean, right? Right. But they right. don't realize there's a charge to the air that actually helps calm them down. There's an actual thing happening scientifically around them. They just think the ocean, oh, I just love the waves. No, no. There's a, you're being surrounded by things that are happening to you. And I feel like I run to the mountains. I run to the beach. And looking out the window is, is not the same thing as getting out. I have to tell you a quick story. My daughter was having a, uh, a day. It had been more than a day, but it had cu- accumulated. And I could see the tension on her face. And I knew that there was not, I needed to not be this mom, talk, talk, talk. I needed, but I needed to help mentor her to get onto the other side because it, it was not going to be good for her. So I said, um, put on some flip-flops. Let's take a walk. They're used to me saying, let's take a walk if somebody's stressed. So everybody's kind of used to that. So I tried to be quiet. We took a walk to a park close by and she was walking like military marching. She was so wound up. We get to the park. She's still marching. I say, take your shoes off, sweetheart. Let's stand in the grass. And so we're standing in the grass and she's still wound up. Pretty soon I'm like, just, you know, breathe a little, close your eyes. They're used to this. I'm always reminding them to breathe. So I basically got her calm and we literally stood. We just stood in the park for like 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30. I don't know. I didn't watch the time. And as we walked home, she was walking and her shoulders were lighter. And it literally all we did was go stand in the grass and there were soccer players because they practice at the park. We were surrounded with people, but there's something about breaking the rhythm of life. Right. Right. And giving right. our bodies our like you said, the head and the heart, you can't, you can't separate those things. Mm. I was going to say, I'm very lucky. I live on an Island in the middle of Narragansett Bay. So I have easy access to the ocean. I can see the bay from my window. I had a feeling when you looked out the window, I thought, I bet she has a beautiful view. I do. I have a beautiful view of Narragansett Bay and the Newport Bridge. Um, We live on the island next to Newport. And I have, on my downstairs deck, I have uh, some hummingbird feeders set up in my perennial bed. And I love to sit there and watch the hummingbirds come and feed and watch the ships go by going up and down Narragansett Bay. And that's another thing that really, I think, lowers your stress level. Observing nature, looking at birds, looking at animals, experiencing, as you said, the ocean, even if it's just watching it. Isn't it interesting? I think we all instinctively know, right? Like you want to get away, the Calgon commercial. Yeah. <laughs> It's the same idea that we instinctively know and our hearts. I was interviewing another doctor who does work on like how uh, emotions affect the heart, you know, and how there's layers of emotion that really begin to impact that in your practice. Did you find that sometimes people didn't necessarily have like clinical issue with their heart, but that there were evidences of things bothering them. It could have been emotional that you kind of had to walk them through to kind of help their hearts, if you will? Sure. I mean, we know, for example, that depression is a risk factor for developing a cardiac event. There's a much higher mortality rate in the year after the death of a spouse. When most people suffer from depression, losing a long-term partner. So the first year after the loss of a spouse is a real is a time of heightened mortality, and that's thought to be related to depression. And I was, you know, taught by my mentors when I was a fellow that if one of your patients is depressed, that's going to make their outcome 
they're good outcome, less certain. So you need to address issues of depression in your patients. Again, you can't separate the head from the heart without fatal consequences. Mm. I said you really have to treat the whole patient, not just their heart. I appreciate that because I'm going through some things with my mother-in-law. I'm I'm kind of her advocate at all of her doctor's appointments. My father-in-law died a year ago. And um, that is the frustration because I think we do need to remember that we're mind, body, spirit. There's a bunch of things going on. and, And when somebody's heart is bothering them, they definitely need to go to the doctor. But we also need to, the conversation you and I are having is kind of pan out a little bit and get a picture of what's happening in your world right? that can be, I don't know, managed is even possible sometimes, but, you know, becoming aware of it and handling it. What are some of the um, symptoms that women can kind of maybe be aware of? Because I've heard it's it's much more silent, if you will, in women. Right. Women are more likely than men to have what are called silent heart attacks where they have no chest pain. Women who have narrowings of the artery supplying the heart, when they have the symptom called angina, which was first described in 1768 by a physician in England. And in those days, the doctors wrote in Latin. So when he described this new symptom, he called it angina pectoris, which means a strangling or a choking in the, in the chest. His name was uh, William Heberden. So for a long time, was known as Heberden's angina. He, he didn't call it dolor pectoris, which is pain in the chest. He called it angina pectoris because most people don't experience the symptom when their heart is temporarily starved for oxygen as a pain. They experience it as a pressure or heaviness or burning. Now, that's very typical of men. Women sometimes just experience shortness of breath when their heart is starved for oxygen. So, you know, if a woman with risk factors for the disease, an older woman or a woman with severe high blood pressure or a woman who's a smoker or diabetic, if that patient came to me and said, you know, Dr. Roberts, I used to be able to run up the stairs, no problem. Now, halfway up, I have to stop because I'm short of breath. My ears would immediately perk up because that woman could be having angina. And it's not manifesting as a discomfort it's manifesting as a shortness of breath, a difficult so normal activity level is somehow being impeded. And now you have to stop and breathe where you didn't have to before. Correct. Okay. Correct. Any change in your exercise tolerance, change in exercise tolerance. Okay. And I, you know, I had another patient who was a very avid bicycler and he, he was a physician and he would bicycle for miles and miles and miles, and hours and hours and hours. And he noticed that he was covering less ground in two hours of bicycling than he used to. And that, that symptom was progressive, and he realized he was getting short of breath. And it turned out that he had another kind of heart disease, not vascular heart disease, but what's called an infiltrative heart disease, which is one of the rare cardiac conditions for which there is no treatment, and he wound up dying of it. But his first symptom was a change in his exercise tolerance. Okay. So it doesn't have to be anything as dramatic as severe chest pain, although severe chest pain is always a medical emergency. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you have severe chest pain, call rescue and get to the emergency room. It may not be your heart. It may be a clot in your lungs. It may be a, a tear of the aorta, but severe chest pain is always a medical emergency. Okay. So now you, as a doctor who's really helped women, what have you found in your practice has been the most satisfying? What have you loved about what you do? I love helping patients manage chronic disease because, you know, heart disease tends to be a chronic disease. People can live for decades after a heart attack. But if their heart attack was precipitated by an unhealthy lifestyle, they need to make some lifestyle changes that may be very difficult. And you're not going to get a patient to make difficult lifestyle choices on the very first visit. And you're certainly not going to ever get them to make those changes if you're brusque and abrupt and make the patient feel that they're hurried. I used to tell my students, my interns and residents and fellows, the most important thing you can do for your patients is listen. Most people want to be listened to. And if you're constantly interrupting them or checking off boxes on a computer, you're not listening to your patient. Right. 
Right. I, so I refuse to have a computer in my consulting room. I can take notes while I look at the patient. I can take notes by hand. I can't handle a computer and give someone my undivided attention at the same time. I always said I didn't go to medical school to be a data entry clerk. And I think the way that medicine is going is un- injurious to doctors and to patients. And I hope that someday it'll be reformed. That would be great because I've noticed that one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing because no one goes to the computer to check. Remember when they used to hang the paper, the clipboard on the end and everybody wrote in the yes. same clipboard? Right. right. Try to read an electronic health record. It's almost impossible. It's just the same mistakes regurgitated over and over again. <laughs> we, that's, what, that's your next calling, Barbara. It's to uh, come up with this incredible technological solution to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, called, it's called listening. Oh, gosh. It's not high tech. It's not high tech at all. I want to go back to this quote that you said, you can't separate the head from the heart without fatal consequences. And one of my favorite topics of conversation is mindset. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective, your life as well, not just as a cardiologist, but just as a woman who's lived the life you've lived and the adventures you've had and the decisions you've made. What role has mindset um, had in your decisions and in your life? Because the choice you've made as a doctor to be mindful of your patients is actually a mindset, right? Yes. Well, you know, even though I'm no longer religious at all, I always say I'm, I'm a devout pagan. Um, I was raised in a very large, very devout Catholic family. I'm the oldest of 10 children. And even though I parted ways with the church as a young woman, I think I was trained to be a person who wanted to give back, to be a person who wanted to help others, to be a person who was kind. And that never left me. I was taught that we should treat everyone we meet as if he were Jesus in disguise. And so uh, that meant as a physician that I would render the same attention and care to the homeless person turned up by the plow on Main Street as I would to the head of the most large corporation in town. It didn't matter what the patient was. It didn't matter if the patient was a mobster or a a wife beater, or once I took care of a member of the Shah of Iran's dreaded secret police, he was in Sabak. It didn't matter except insofar as it related to his level of stress in his life. What mattered was that I needed to put their interests ahead of my own. That's after all what the Hippocratic Oath says. First, do no harm. Second, put your patient's interest ahead of your own. And that means making sacrifices. But again, my Catholic upbringing taught me that sacrifice was good. Yes. Yes. So what I hear you saying is the mindset that you work from is one of not martyrhood otherness, but service to others. Correct. There's a difference, is there not? Oh, yes, there is. I mean, I was raised to be a martyr, but I quickly shed that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to be a martyr. I wanted yeah. to make positive change without dying. Yes. Well, and then you have the whole of when you do something for someone expecting nothing in return, how does that impact your health? I think it can only help your health. Because if you're only doing things for other people expecting some kind of payback, then in the vast majority of cases, you're probably going to be disappointed. If you do it because you know it'll help you to be kind and to be generous, then you're going to see double benefit because you're going to benefit the other person. You're going to benefit yourself. So your greatest joy was in finding other people to help. In yes. Their health. Yes. And how many years did you practice? Well, I graduated medical school in 1968, by which time I had already spent two years, you know, as a clinical clerk on the wards taking care of patients. And I retired from clinical practice in 2016. So what's that? Long time. That is a long time. As I said, I still uh, volunteer teach 
I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it this summer, um, but for the last three years before this summer, I would spend one day a week mentoring in the medical clinic at my hospital, at the Miriam Hospital, teaching, as I used to say, I used to kid the residents, I'm here to teach you how to be a real doctor. <laughs> would you agree, Barbara, that one person with that mindset can begin to turn situations around for the greater good? Of course. It's I amazing. believe that with all my heart. Mm-hmm. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you uh, one last question. When you are thinking of what you've done in cardiology and what that's meant to you, and if you could kind of wrap up all of those years of experience, so 68, 78, 88, 98, 08, 18, so what was that, 40, 48 years? 40 plus years, yeah, close to 50 years. That's an incredible amount of service to people in their health. And uh, if you had to kind of wrap all of that up and say, okay, how can I package this and, and kind of distill it down to what three things would you really want people to hear from your experience, your knowledge in your life, whether it's heart health, I'd love to have a heart health tip, but anything that you in your life as a woman who has served and lived this amazing life and mentored and done these things, what can you hand back to someone who's coming along behind you or beside you? Well, one of the things that I think is important is that you have to make a conscious decision to be a survivor. We all experience trauma and tragedy in our lives. We all experience sickness, we all experience disappointment. We might even be victims of violence. You have to make a conscious decision to be a survivor. I used to say only half jokingly, no matter what happens, I would never kill myself. I would never give my enemies the satisfaction of, <laughs> of being a suicide. So I think it's important to decide to be a survivor and then to, as much as possible, realize that if you don't get what you want, maybe it's because you're going to get something better. And you will look back on a disappointment and realize that it was a good thing that you had that disappointment. Mm. So make that conscious decision to be a survivor. As much as possible, if you don't get what you want, look for the better to come. What year did you write that book, How to Keep from Breaking Your Heart, by the way? Um, it was published in 2004, and the second edition came out in 2009. Okay, so it's fairly recent. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, that's an interesting thing that you started your authorship after 50 as well. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I love that. She said the conscious decision to be a survivor, you know, mm -hmm. understanding that life's going to happen mm -hmm. to everyone. That's key. And then as much as possible... If you don't get what you want, maybe really having that global perspective of maybe that was a gift. Right. I, I, this is what I was thinking, but I would say take care of your body. It's the only body you have. And if you take care of it, hopefully you will live a long and healthy life. I used to tell my patients, we all have to die. The trick is to stay healthy till the second you go. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> So what's next for you? I, I wanted to highlight the fact that when you wrote your first book, it was in 2004. And right. then you have a revised in 2009, How to Keep from Breaking Your Heart. And of course, with Feminine Roadmap, one of the things I like to highlight is the amazing things that people can accomplish just because they're still on this side of the soil, right? Age is right. just a number. And so how old were you when you wrote that book? About in 2004, I was, I was born in 1944, so I was 60, right? Or 50. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, that's and, and my last book before this most recent one was published in 2012, and that was The Truth About Statins. Oh, my mom would love that book. Statins are poison, but anyway, I don't want to get off on that. So, just as a woman who's 
past midlife, you've retired, you've started writing books and having these impacts in different ways. What encouragement could you give to another woman who might be at that transition of whatever defined them for 40, 50 years comes to an end? How, how, did, you, how did you navigate that transition for yourself? You know, I was very lucky in that I had a quote unquote easy menopause. Um, you know, I don't remember being troubled by hot flashes. Maybe it's because I was exercising so vigorously. Uh, I, I sweat enough during the day. That I didn't have to sweat at night. Um, and so I, it really, you know, it, it didn't affect me terribly uh, as far as symptoms go. And what I found was and I think this is rather commonplace, I had a tremendous amount of energy that was freed up because I, I think, you know, this is going to sound weird, but I believe in my case, and I think in the case of many women, your reproductive years are a prolonged siege of temporary insanity. <laughs> <laughs> and once your reproductive years are over, you sort of come out of this insane period in your life and you find you have all kinds of energy that you didn't have while your hormones were you know raging every month and I have gotten so much done in my postmenopausal years it's it's really been kind of remarkable I you know it's something that no one really told me about but I discovered it on my own and that is why I, one of the things that Feminine Roadmap is about, finding women like you who say, hey, there's some great years ahead. Amazing to do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And can you, can you honestly say that you've even marveled at your own experiences? I have. I never realized that my 70s would be so much fun. I've had a blast. That's so fantastic. I need women like you to be out there telling women that we are so much more than our age. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's just a number and you can be biologically older or younger than your chronologic age. A lot depends on how well you take care of yourself. Yes. Yes. But I, what I hear from you, Barbara, is it, it's a lot of what goes on between your ears. Yes, it it's, is. It's what you think and how your beliefs guide you, the decisions that you make. Absolutely correct. And so you did almost 50 years of service to people, keeping them healthy, t- teaching them how to care for themselves. And in the process, you became a woman who is, you know, writing books and living this life and mentoring people behind you. And I think that's where the vitality comes in. Your heart of service seems to really give you that extra burst of energy because you're living for something outside of yourself. Yes. I would be very bored if I wasn't doing all the things I'm doing, I think. (laughs) But I've never been bored, so I don't want to find out what boredom is like. And one last question. Wouldn't you say that past a certain age especially, that activity, brain activity, as well as physical activity of any kind is actually key to promoting healthier aging? Absolutely. You know what I do first thing every morning? What? I turn on my computer and I do the New York Times crossword puzzle and the New York Times spelling bee. Get your brain. Puzzle and it keeps my brain active. I... I love starting my day with the New York Times crossword puzzles. <laughs> well, you do have to think crossword puzzles can be hard. <laughs> well, Saturday is the hardest, actually. Wednesday and Sunday are about equivalent levels of, of, of difficulty. But I love the spelling bee. It's uh, how many words you can use making the seven letters they give you, and every word has to contain the, the letter that's in the middle. And um, usually I can get to the genius level. At least I keep striving until I get to the genius level most days, unless I run out of time. What's that called again? It's called the Spelling Bee. It's on New York Times? New York Times. And you don't have to subscribe to the New York Times, the whole paper. You can subscribe to their puzzles. And I love doing acrostic puzzles also. I do 
the New York Sunday Times has an acrostic puzzle every other week, every other Sunday, and I do those faithfully. And there's another site um, where they have free acrostic puzzles, and I do those, try and do a couple of those each day. I read voraciously. I always have, you know, either a book or a Kindle on my nightstand. I love to read. Reading is one of my favorites, but I love, you know how I detox. And one thing before I let you go is uh, jigsaw puzzles. Oh, really? Yeah. Somehow for my brain doing a puzzle and just the processing, it relaxes my brain in a weird sort of way. Mm -hmm. And I actually come up with some really great ideas and solutions while I'm doing puzzles. I think because it distracts my subconscious mind. Yeah. kind of sidetracks it and gets it to wake up a little bit. It's pretty awesome. So mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of a wonderful a jigsaw puzzle right now. I used to do word searches because I just enjoy finding patterns. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Barbara, for spending your time with me today, for sharing your expertise, for being the heart doctor I was looking for because I really wanted to have this conversation. I think we hear about the conversation. We hear about the conversation, but we don't necessarily have someone that I can ask questions and really kind of start the conversation in the community around the world that listens to the Feminine Roadmap. And of course, you also have a new book out and I will send people to your Amazon page because that's where they will find out who you are, what you're about, and all the great things that you're writing. And again, I want to thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciate you. It was my pleasure, Gina, and thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. I've been speaking with Barbara Roberts. She is a retired cardiologist. She is also the director of the Women's Cardiac Center at the Miriam Center. She is an author of several books. And if you head over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 119, I will have a link to Barbara's Amazon page and you can get over there and see all of the books that she's written. Learn a little bit more about her. While you're at the website, please leave your name and your email address. I do have a gift for you. And if you head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, I would love to have you subscribe and rate the podcast. The more people that do that, the more people can hear these messages. And from women like Barbara, who have life-giving, life-encouraging messages, women who inspire and draw us higher and make us recognize we all have the capacity to do amazing things. If you are here, you are here for a purpose. Get at that, my friends, and always take care of your health. Move your body, rest your mind, eat well. I look forward to talking to you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.